You are a Locked On Braves postcast, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta, your team every day. Hello and welcome into the Braves postcast, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta and the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Grant McCauley alongside Jake Mastriani as the Braves come through with a 5-1 win to even up their three-game series with the Phillies at a game apiece. Force that rubber match on Sunday, and they do so with some timely hitting, at least as far as home runs is concerned. They got plenty against Ranger Suarez to support Spencer Schwellenbach, who threw, I would say, the start of his young career, the best one that we have seen thus far. We'll talk all about that, and of course, we'll get you set up for Sunday's finale as the Braves will look to take a series from the first-place Phillies as well. Before we get started on all that, make sure you hit that thumbs-up button, subscribe to Locked On Sports Atlanta on YouTube, and subscribe to Locked On Braves wherever you get your podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by Booking.com. Booking. Yeah, the right stay can make you a fan of any city, even your rivals. Check out Booking.com for your stay today. Jake, it was a much better game all around for the Braves. They got some early runs, some timely hitting with two outs. They certainly needed that. It came in the form of home runs, uh, the majority of it for Atlanta to do what it needed to on this day. But uh, what was happening on the mound for Spencer Schwellenbach was as big or maybe even a bigger story than what Atlanta was able to do at the plate. He looked terrific, and I think that this was the kind of start that uh, just reminds you that this is a kid, I think, that has an awful lot of promise, and he delivered in a big way to help the Braves win this game. He did. I mean, you look at the pitching matchups coming into the series, and this is the one that you you thought would be a little bit tricky for the Braves with Ranger Suarez going up against the young kid in Schwellenbach. As good as this stuff has been, I know me and you both have been impressed by him. He is still a young kid going up against a really good lineup. So, yeah, I thought he was, you know, as great as the home runs were and the offense putting up, you know, another big number. I thought the story of the night was Spencer Schwellenbach on the mound. Most definitely. The Braves jumped on Ranger Suarez. They backed up Schwellenbach to even up this series. And while we should talk about the offense, because this was one of those games where the Braves scored enough, they kept their opponent down and, and under control throughout the entirety of this game. Uh, this was the best start, though, of Schwellenbach's young career. Six innings of one-run ball, six strikeouts, no walks, I thought. And, and I know we'll get into this a lot more later and kind of break it down a bit more of a granular look at this start. But big picture stuff. I mean, this is exactly the kind of outing that you needed. You didn't get it from Max Fried, unfortunately, in the opener. But Schwellenbach seemed like he was just able to stay one step ahead of Philly's hitters. He was, and you do that by throwing five pitches between 16 and 21% of the time. I mean, when you're able to do that and have the command, it's not even just control, it was command. And again, we've talked about being able to throw these pitches in spots where he wants to, and he's able to do that. We know he throws a ton of strikes, but he was throwing them in you know, much more quality strikes, I thought, tonight. And when you can do that and, again, mix in so many pitches, that splitter I thought was the difference maker for him tonight. You saw a lot of swings and misses on that. In fact, he got five swings or five whiffs on nine swings against that split changeup for him. It's just, you know, it's the deep arsenal that he has. And like we've talked about in a kid that throws strikes, it's just continuing to mature and know when to throw those strikes, where to throw those strikes and what types of counts. And I thought he did a great job of it tonight. So really loved what I've seen from him. just, you know, again, that's a kid that's growing right in front of our eyes at the big league level. And I think he's, he's shown enough, even though the results haven't been there, the Braves have stuck with him because they see, you know, what we all see the, the, the guy just has really good stuff, good command of that stuff. And I know the ERA is up. You look at the expected ERA on Savant, though, it's 3.90 in the threes. So again, everything is pointing to this kid being able to have more starts like this. Yeah, I think so. And I think a tip of the cap, or at least some acknowledgement as well to the guy behind the plate for him on this night, Sean Murphy, helping to kind of walk him through that. I know that's something that you know, talking to some of these Braves pitchers, really all of them will tell you this, that the preparation that goes into that, the trust that's built in the battery, whether it's Murphy or whether it's Travis Darno who's behind the plate, I should say, that version of the battery, not out you know, in the shops and restaurants and all that stuff. But I think that that kind of gives an extra level of, of comfort because of, you know, the work that's done and the tendencies of these hitters that the Braves are going to plan around and obviously pitch to the strengths as well of the guys on the mound. A.J. Minter said that's a huge thing that he learned from Travis Darno in particular was I got to pitch to my strengths. And I think that with Schwellenbach to kind of bring this whole thing full circle, he has a lot of strength in that he has a very good arsenal. So even as a young pitcher who might be tempted to look at, okay, well, what are the weaknesses of the hitter? Let me attack that. Sometimes sticking with what works for you is a big part of that. And I think that's something that Travis Darno and Sean Murphy help lead these Braves pitchers through 
the correct way to help them get the best result. Yeah, and it's you know it's similar to Max Fried. I'm not trying to compare him to Max Fried, but Max Fried has a deep arsenal, and and sometimes he has to, he doesn't have a pitch, and you have to know, and that's the, on the pitcher and the catcher as well to know what is working and and what maybe come back around. What do you show for a minute, and then hey, go back to it later in the game to find out what's working for you. And again, when you have just that deep arsenal and you have the command for the most part of those pitches, but again, it's it's knowing what's working, it's knowing what you have that night, and that's you know a big credit to the pitcher, mm-hmm. you know, and the catcher as well, working together and knowing that. At the plate, it was Marcelo Zuna who capped a three-run first inning for the Braves with a two-run homer, his twenty-third of the season. It went to straightaway center field, a two-out blast for the Big Bear, the kind of hit that the Braves I think have really been looking for. And, and we're looking for a couple other times during the night, most certainly. And Ozzie Albies delivered one of those a little bit later, especially when it felt like, were you looking at a Braves offense that wasn't going to be able to cash in, find those insurance runs? Ozzie Albies said, not so fast. I'll take care of that. And he did. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. But for Ozuna, you know, this has been, I think, a year in which he has provided so much for the Braves. And that first inning home run against a pitcher like Ranger Suarez, who it feels like at least has had the Braves number far more times than not, whether or not he looks dominant or not, he's getting the job done. It was good to put a three spot on the board for a variety of reasons, including, you know, this is an offense that needed a jolt, and Ozuna's been delivering that all year long. He has. Look, this was a night where Ozuna just looked locked in. I mean, every bat up there, and we've seen it. It's easy to see from Ozuna. You kind of can see telling him in the box. You know, he kind of has a little bit of of swagger to him. You can tell when he's just locked in, and this was one of those nights where you just felt like he was going to crush everything that he swung at and huge first inning. Like you said, we've had innings first innings this year where, you know, they put some pressure on either didn't score. Maybe they scored just one when it felt like they had a chance to score more. So it was great to see them be able to put that crooked number up in the first inning. But I just love what we've seen from Ozuna. Again, it's been a little bit of a cold streak, certainly by his standards, but good to see him again, kind of get locked back in against a very good pitcher, come up with some big hits there for the Braves. Hopefully this means he's about to get right back to where he's been for most of the season. And it really felt like that intensity that you were talking about, that focus, was on display in that first game as well, obviously hitting the three-run homer. But I felt like the way he was kind of dueling with Aaron Nola throughout some of those at-bats early in the game were just kind of an indicator. It just felt like maybe Marcel had figured something out and was feeling a bit more like himself again. Ozzy Albee, speaking of which, continued his hot streak, has to be feeling pretty good at the plate, extended his hitting streak to nine games. He homered in the fifth inning, a two-run blast. And I, I know that obviously a lot of focus can be on how hot Ozzy is. And, you know, we, we want to talk about that as well. But I felt like, Jake, that two run homer was a big hit to pick up some of his teammates at the bottom of the order because the Braves had another chance in the fourth inning that felt like a lot of innings this year, too many innings this year in which the Braves put runners on second and third with nobody out, aren't able to score a couple of big strikeouts, one looking, one swinging. Then an infield pop up after an intentional walk to Orlando Arcia. That's a sentence I didn't know I'd be saying at any point this year unless they reinstituted pitchers hitting. But that's exactly the way the Phillies went about it. And Ranger Suarez able to wriggle off the hook. But it was Jared Kelnick and Ozzy Albies who immediately threw him back in the deep end the next inning. That's just to kind of hit Jake, I guess, to make a long story short. The Braves need a little bit more of that. Whether they're able to capitalize every inning or not, you know, that's not really the debate here. It's finding as many opportunities as they can and cashing in as often as they can. And it just hasn't felt like an offense that's been able to do that nearly as much this year. And the fourth inning was a bitter reminder of how challenging it can be at times. Yes, a lot I want want to say about this. I've talked about all the time on here that when this team was going so good last year as they were all year, it was pressure every inning. Mm -hmm. And they didn't always come through. I mean, you can go back and watch last year. There were many times where they had situations like that, and they didn't, but there was pressure every inning where they just had runners on. And you know, eventually, you are going to come up with that big hit. We just haven't seen that enough. This year, there's been too many games where there's only one, two, three chances throughout a game, and you know you don't come through on a couple of those, and you're not going to score enough runs to win. And Adam Wainwright must be a big listener of the postcast because he said just that on the broadcast that that's what this team did last year. They continue to put pressure on you top to bottom, and you just don't have that. Even tonight, the bottom of the, of the order, you got nothing, but the top of the order was able to come through. But that fourth inning, look, it's not great. You want to come through. But I think, you know, could that have played into what happened in the fifth inning? Ranger Suarez had kind of started cruising along, was locked in there, and then you make him throw almost 30 pitches in that inning. You know, you get you come up against the bottom of the order and it you know, allows him to kind of work through that. We know, again, as I just said, the bottom of the order, kind of struggling for the Braves. But you did make him really have to work 
in that bottom of the fourth. And then credit to Swellenbach goes out there, has a quick top of the fifth, puts Ranger Suarez back yep. on the mound very quickly. And then boom, boom, next thing you know, two run homer and the Braves are up 5-1. So uh, again, I think all that kind of just plays into to what happened with the Braves offense there tonight. Yeah, I think that's a really good summation of it as well. And sometimes, you know, when you, or a lot of times, when you manage to maintain that pressure, keep that pressure going, you will find that a pitcher is going to have some trouble just trying to, you know, get himself back into the dugout to sit down for a little while. When Spencer Schwellenbach, you're absolutely right, made it a little bit more difficult for Ranger Suarez, who had to throw a bunch of pitches in the fourth to have any kind of rest between innings. He was right back out, and the Braves went right back to work. And maybe that's a good sign of things that the Braves can continue to capitalize on, just trying to get as many guys on base as possible. But it was a very lopsided offensive night. We'll talk more about that as we go along, and obviously we'll talk more about the great work of Spencer Schwellenbach. It's coming your way as the Braves postcast continues. Are you taking that dream vacation this summer but dreading the cost? With Ibotta, you get cash back on all of your purchases so you can spend more time making memories this summer and less time dreaming about them. The average Ibotta user saves or earns, I should say, $256 per year. That could cover the cost of an entire shopping trip, that flight you've been eyeing, or the fancy dinner that you've been craving. Right now, Ibotta is offering our listeners $5 off just for trying Ibotta by using the code LOCKEDONMLB when you register. Go to the App Store or Google Play Store, download the free Ibotta app, and start earning cash back. And remember to use the code LOCKEDONMLB. That's spelled I-B-O-T-T-A. Find Ibotta in the Google Play or App Store. Use the code LOCKEDONMLB. You'll get that $5 off. Jake, let's look inside the line score and box score of this game as the Braves improve to 48 and 39 on the season, pick up a game on the Phillies, obviously, that they had just dropped on Friday in the process of this 5-1 win. Atlanta, five runs, six hits, no errors, and six men left on base. The Phillies dropped to 58-31 and 31. still. The best record in baseball, run on seven hits, one error, and six men left on base for them. Winning pitcher Spencer Schwellenbach now 2-4 and four on the year. Ranger Suarez takes the loss, drops to 10-3. and three. Let's talk a little bit more about Swellenbach. I know we got into some of the pitch mix that made him so successful, but six innings, seven hits, one run. It was earned, no walks, and six strikeouts. Really, as I was watching him pitch as well, the only trouble that he got into was that little third inning jam, and it was a lot of well-placed or soft contact. He was not getting hit hard. It did, again, feel like he was really working over that Phillies lineup and having them set up exactly the way he wants them. No walks, six strikeouts. Those are a couple of things that jump off the page as well. As you were watching him, especially using that deep arsenal that he has, I would imagine you were pretty pleased with what Spencer Schwellenbach was able to do and able to pitch with a lead throughout this game. I think that's a big thing for a young pitcher. Yeah, he hasn't gotten a lot of run support you know, in his career so far. But that third inning, I mean, that is – that just shows so much maturity from Spencer Schwellenbach. I think when you give up a infield single where he almost made an incredible play yes. to get the runner out, and then you have a ball that goes off Matt Olson's glove, and then the runner kicks it. You know, maybe if he doesn't kick it there, Olson's able to pick it up and and get an out. And then you got to face Trey Turner with two on and one out, and he does rocket one, but it, luckily this one stays in the ballpark and only drives in one run. But then he's able to bear down after that, make some really good pitches. Gets Alec Bohm to fly out and then strikes out Brandon Marsh to end it with a really good uh, slider that he got him down over the top of his shoelaces there. It was just really impressive stuff from Schrellenbach. And look, we talked about it. Even in some of these starts where he's given up some runs, I have mentioned it's it's been impressive that he's able to kind of push that aside and work through that to still continue on in the outings. And again, I just think that's that really speaks to the maturity of him. I do also want to mention the play by Adam Duvall in the second inning before that. Uh, that kind of helped him work out of a jam there. You had a runner yeah. on uh, and a hit there, and Adam Duvall was able to get the runner at second base. That was that was crucial as well in the start for Schwellenbach, who did give up seven hits, but uh, for the most part, you know, obviously kept them in the yard, which is very key facing that Phillies lineup. And again, I just thought that third inning, I thought that was that was a pivotal point in the ball game because you get a couple of, of weak hits there on infield hits. You're going through the top of their order, Trey Turner. Uh, you, get, you give up a hit to him, but then are able to just quickly bounce back and get through that. Uh, again, I thought that was the huge inning for Schwellenbach. Really just after that, kind of breeze through. Yeah, and you're right about the Duval play as well, that throw and the uh, the subsequent overturn at second base. That was helpful most certainly for him. 
And as so I looked and, and you watch this kid kind of work along the way that he has throughout the course of his very young big league career. I mean, he's only made, what, seven starts now, I believe, in the major leagues. That's Brian Snitker before the game. I mean, what has stood out from him? Because sometimes, I mean, you bring up a lot of young pitchers at 21, 22 years old. I mean, you think about A.J. smith or, or Hurston Waldrop most recently. You know, what's different about Spencer Schwellenbach? Because it wasn't that he came to the big leagues with a whole bunch of innings under his belt at 24 years old. It was kind of quite the opposite. But Brian Snitker said, you know, mound presence really stands out to him. Athleticism really stands out. And when you look at the play he nearly made in the third inning, that would kind of underscore that as well. But, you know, pitchability is another thing that you and I have talked about and already gotten into on this show. This is somebody that seems to be, you know, a little bit more polished than the average pitcher that comes to the major leagues. And I think he's showing that with his, you know, being such a strike thrower, uh, that he's got what it takes to have himself some success at the major leagues. And again, if the Braves can get him some run support, you know, maybe he'll be able to settle himself in and be a part of what the Braves are trying to accomplish on the mound and in the starting rotation in particular as well. Um, Ozzie Albies with that RBI double in the first inning, Chase Tom Jared Kelnick, or excuse me, RBI single in the first, Chase Tom Kelnick, who had doubled. Then a two-run homer off Ranger Suarez in the fifth. Ozzie is now batting 389 over the course of his nine-game hitting streak, 14 for 36. Jake, we've talked about different guys at different times needing to get, to get things going, but Ozzie, where he is in the lineup right now, he's got to be able to do this kind of thing or, or find this kind of hot streak in order to help the Braves lineup start to feel like it's got the same kind of bite that it had a year ago. Batting second in the order, you're going to get a lot of plate appearances, and it looks like Ozzie Albies is kind of starting to come into his own after – what have been, certainly from a power standpoint, especially a challenging start to his season as well. And, you know, it doesn't look like it when you when you see Ozzy Albies, but power is what he brings to the plate. You know, that's what, uh, you know, he's kind of made a living off of and why he's been so spectacular as a second baseman just because of that power that he brings you. And this night, you saw a little bit of both. In the first inning hit that he had, I don't know if it was intentional. I would like to think that it was, but you had a runner on second, no out. And you got a pitch kind of running in on you, and he's able to shoot it the other way. And when I'm watching that, I'm thinking, okay, you know, obviously you want Ozzy to turn and burn just like he did later in the game and crush one. That's what you want him to do. Uh, but it was a pitch coming in on him. He's able to get his hands in, drive it the other way, and it goes for a hit. But, you know, at the very least, even if it didn't, would have moved the runner over. And then you see later in the game, like you said, he kind of he gets one inside and he does turn on it, came in with a cutter again. This time he was on time with it and able to pull it out to left field. So great to see that from Ozzy again. That's what that's what you want from him, especially when he's batting right-handed. He has to take advantage of those at-bats when he's facing left-handed pitchers. You know how great he is uh, against that uh, against Southpaw. So, again, you want to really see him in those spots. Great to see him start to come through and come with that power. I mean, that's what that's what Ozzy brings you. That's what makes him so unique, as I was trying to say earlier, as a second baseman just because of that great power that he has. Yeah, and we haven't seen as much of that this year. He's one of several Braves whose power numbers and the on pace, if you want to look at it that way, for what they could be doing this year or what they're on pace to do this year has been well below a career norm. Uh, Ozzie Albee is just one of several Braves hitters dealing with that, though. Marcelo Zuna, however, is not. He retook the National League lead with 72 runs batted in by belting that two-run homer in the first inning. A couple of hits in the game, 38 of his 72 runs batted in have come with two outs this year. That is a, a total that I believe leads Major League Baseball as well. Marcelo Zuna, quite simply, has been the guy for the Braves this year uh, that has come through, and you can look at the RBI column, and it tells you. Then you look at the hitting when they need it with two outs, and Ozuna able to do it again in the first inning today. I looked up and down the box score, as you like to do, and try to see, did everybody contribute? The answer to that question is no, they did not. Four of the six hits belong to Ozuna and Albies. The other two belong to Jared Kelnick, who went two for four and scored two runs, nearly had a third hit as well. Uh, but the rest of the lineup, not so much. 0 for 25 with 10 punch outs. And it was a rough game for Austin Riley, which we haven't said in about three or four weeks at least. He was 0 for 3 with three strikeouts. And you could tell, and I have noticed this a little bit, there's some frustration from Braves hitters that we weren't really seeing last year. There's a lot more bat slamming, a lot more helmets being flung away than I have uh, been accustomed to seeing with this club. And I've talked to different guys this week over the course of this homestand. I talked to Austin Riley about it. I talked to Michael Harris about it and just kind of visiting with him and seeing, you know, year over year, what are you seeing that's different, what feels different, all of those things. And you can tell that guys are feeling a bit of that pressure that has mounted with the results not being what they want it to be, 
and not being able to come through at times when they want it to. So if they could figure out a way to kind of hit that release valve and, and I don't know, slow the game down a little bit, which is not, it's easier said than done, I guess, maybe they'll start to find some of those normal results. But you can tell, you know, whether it's an emotional outburst or whatever you want to call it, little things that we weren't seeing a year ago. But this lineup has very much kind of had this this tale to it, Jake, this year, where a couple of three guys are doing something and the rest of the lineup is really searching. Yeah, I mean, while you want to be excited about the offense in both of these games, and I think you should be because the home run ball is back in play. And as I said last night, if you're going to hit two to three home runs a game, I like our chances of winning with this pitching staff. And that's what you got tonight. You got those two home runs and you got a great pitching game. So, you know, that's if that's, those are coming, those home runs are coming. I feel much better about this offense going forward. But as you said, all six hits coming from three hitters tonight, you know, more than half of the strikeouts coming from Riley Olson and Murphy, three of your big sticks in your lineup. Now, well, not great overall, only six hits in the game. You certainly would like to have more than that. I mean, they were facing a really good pitcher mm-hmm. in Ranger Suarez, but you knock him out after five innings and you would, you know, like to add on a little bit more against that bullpen and just weren't able to do that. So, you know, it's again, uh, this, this offense is going to be built around home runs. If those are coming great. I want to go back to the tar- part you're talking about guys being fired up and seeing, you know, frustration, whatever you want to call it. I know you mentioned yeah. it last night, yeah. but you know, you saw that on the mound from Swellenbach going to go back to him because that was the good part of the night. You saw him get emotional after a couple of strikeouts and big outs coming off the mound. I think you are seeing more of that here lately from this Braves team. I know it's a big series. You're facing your, your rival, you know, in the, in the East that you're trying to, to track down. But I think we are starting to see a little bit more of that fire from this team that, you know, they know they're not playing up to their levels. And as patient as they're trying to be, you know, they want to start seeing the results as well. Yeah, no, they definitely do. I mean, if you think you're noticing at home, I guarantee you they noticed it before you did because they're the ones who are living through it. Doesn't make it any more palatable or any more fun for anybody. But I think that, you know, baseball is a crazy game that has a way of being very cyclical and things kind of working themselves out and the Braves are going to continue. I mean, they're putting in the work prior to these games, trying to get themselves, you know, sorted out and straightened out. It's just been a very, very rough road thus far this year for Atlanta, but a lot of baseball left to be played. We don't know how the whole thing's going to play out and where they could end up, but their day-to-day approach I know has been a big part of their success. And it's not something I expected them to abandon in the face of some struggles over the course of a challenging run, especially at the plate for them this year. As we move along in the Braves postcast, we will take a look ahead to Sunday. We'll also take a look down on the farm for a very encouraging rehab start that happened down in Augusta for Ian Anderson. We'll get to all of that as the Braves postcast continues. Summer travel is heating up, especially travel for baseball games, so it's time to explore those U.S. cities you always secretly wanted to learn more about. Yes, we're talking about your rival cities with hotels, bed and breakfast, vacation rentals, resorts, and so much more on Booking.com. You might just find your perfect stay even in your baseball rival city. From hotels that overlook stadiums to family-friendly resorts, Booking.com has so many choices across the U.S. for your summer travel this MLB season. The right stay can make you a fan of any U.S. city, even your rivals. Book today at Booking.com on the site or in the Booking.com app. Game time is now an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which means make which makes getting tickets even easier and faster. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch, and with killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee. Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets, and they've got those great last minute deals for sports, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. You can save up to sixty percent off buying last minute tickets and take the guesswork out of buying those with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code LOCKEDONMLB for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Just create an account and redeem the code LOCKEDONMLB for $20 off. Download the Game Time app today. Game Time, last-minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Game three of the series happening on Sunday afternoon, 135, is the first pitch for the Braves and the Phillies, the rubber match. Of this three-game series, Atlanta has a chance to take it and take two out of three from Philadelphia behind Reynaldo Lopez on Sunday. And this is a game that marks this showdown, this encounter this weekend, being either a step closer for the Braves or a step back as far as the divisional battle goes. And we know, Jake, that those head-to-head matchups, they're more rare this year and only eight remain after tonight. Yeah, and you hope this series that you're eight games back. Uh, after the, the series is over, it's just it's to the point now. If you want to win this division, you got to sweep some of these series. You got to win just about every opportunity that you get 
against the Phillies. And you got to take care of business, which the Braves just haven't done in the first half. So that's the things you got to do in the second half to catch them. And, you know, you got a chance to do that with Lopez on the mound going against the young pitcher and Ricardo on the other side. We've talked about it with Lopez coming in on this one, going to be on regular rest. He's been uh, kind of struggling uh, to really get through five innings, had to give him a ton of runs, just kind of had to labor and work a lot harder uh, to get through those innings here of the last three starts. And we'll see what happens in this series. But certainly you have now set yourself up with Schwellenbach's outing that he had on Saturday and the offense getting those home runs. You've given your chan- yourself a chance now to win the series and pick up a game. I feel like as you looked at it on paper, where the game is most certainly not played, as we've said many times on this show, if you came in through the first couple of games and felt like, hey, we're going to win one, we might lose one, you might have thought it was going to be the inverse of this, where, hey, maybe Max Fried is able to outduel Aaron Nola, and then, hey, Ranger Suarez is going, and and maybe that's going to be a tough ride, but it was the exact opposite of that, because baseball, as I've said before, is a very funny game, and not funny haha, but funny in the way it likes to basically... Take your expectations and oftentimes flip them on their ear. But either way, you know the Braves have managed to split the first couple of games and put themselves in position to win a series. And Jake, regardless of what they're able to do in the head-to-head matchups, obviously you want to win as many of them as you can. Uh, but g- having the chance to win series or continuing to win series gives you the chance for if the Phillies eventually, at some point, decide to cool off ever so little and the Braves happen to heat up at the same time, all of a sudden, maybe in an eight or a seven game deficit or a six game deficit, if you're able to kind of whittle it away, could get cut in half. And the next thing you know, you're playing them in three or four games and you actually have a chance to take a huge bite out of that division. The Braves have put themselves in position before. They're going to need to do it again over the course of this weekend and the outings ahead and the the head to head matchups ahead between these two teams in the second half because they'll have one more series at Truist Park and then four games at Citizens Bank Park. And, Jake, they also don't face each other again after September 1st. So at that point, you're going to have a pretty serious snapshot of what the divisional race is going to look like. Yeah, and, you know, again, you got a lot of work to do, but you can whittle it down a little bit you know, as you get towards the end of July and the All-Star break, then maybe you can get some momentum going in those that last series, as you mentioned, uh, in, in there. And hopefully, you know, see what you can do. But I think bottom line is – regardless of who it is, you just need to start winning series. And then, you know, this is a chance too to have a winning homestand after you win the series against the pirates, a series they won, but it kind of felt like it, you know, was a rough one because the offense didn't get going. And then you drop a series to the giants. And now you got a chance to pick up one uh, against your rival and the Phillies, a team you're trying to catch. And like I said, have a winning homestand before you go out on this big road trip where they haven't played well. (laughs) The other, other West coast trip this year did not go so well. Uh, So certainly want to try to win a series, like I said, no matter who it's against, but definitely against your rival in the Phillies and a team that you are trying to run down. I'm certainly not giving up on it. We've seen the Braves do it in the past, uh, but it certainly is going to be a a tough task for them. Most definitely. A couple of notes here uh, before we get out of here. Down on the farm, Ian Anderson had a rain short and rehab start, three and a third innings, no hits, no runs, one walk, five strikeouts. Great to see that. It was down at Augusta, second time he has pitched for the Green Jackets on his current rehab assignment. And as we mentioned with uh, Reynaldo Lopez as well, going to be his second assignment on regular rest, just the second time this season. It's an interesting call, Jake, but I think ultimately it's the right call because the Braves wanted to have at least two of their big three starters going in this series. And I don't think they were looking to upset the entire apple cart to try to push everybody back into this series. And Reynaldo Lopez has been a big part of the Braves' success in the first half. Could certainly use another good one here to help give his club a chance to take this series from the Phillies. Yeah, you hope so. Like I said, it's it's he's had to really struggle in these last three starts. I shouldn't say struggle is the wrong word. He's really had to, to work hard and labor in these last three starts. And you worry about him maybe showing some fatigue going from a reliever to a starter's role. But with no off days leading up to the All-Star break, there is almost no way you could get by without having him start two more games anyway. Uh, so, you know, I kind of understand – the decision, but we'll see how he does in this one. And maybe the Braves change that plan up a little bit, but certainly hoping that he comes out and can at least give the Braves another five strong innings. Again, he's, he hasn't given up a ton of runs. It's just, he's had to work a whole lot harder. The command hasn't been quite as sharp and that would lead you to believe that maybe there is just some fatigue for a guy who hasn't been in a starter's role for quite some time. Yeah. And he has managed to, you know, I think be far more good than bad, even in these last three outings in which he has struggled, as you mentioned, it was just kind of the efficiency had gone away for him. And that has led to some shorter outings, including his most recent one in which he had to leave in the fifth, despite allowing just the two runs 
He just wasn't able to get the Braves the length that they need. The Braves, though, are hoping that Reynaldo Lopez can continue what he has done in the first half, maybe give him one more a nice little gym here before the All-Star break. He's 6-2 and two with a 183 ERA, some pretty good numbers. Michael Mercado, 1-0 with a 150, will be on the mound for the Phillies. 135 p.m. Eastern time is the first pitch for Game 3 as the Braves look to take 2 out of 3 from the first-place Phillies and whittle off another game in the standings in the process. That brings us to the end of this edition of the Braves postcast. Make sure you're subscribed to Locked On Sports Atlanta on YouTube and make sure you're subscribed to Locked On Braves wherever you get your podcasts. If you like the show, be sure to go ahead, hit that thumbs up button down there. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel. Leave us those comments and share the show with a friend. We very much appreciate that. Once again, the Braves were able to even up their series with the Phillies with a 5-1 win behind Spencer Schwellenbach and some long ball action. Can they do it again on Sunday with some timely offense and a good start from Ronaldo Lopez? We will all find out, and we will talk to you when that game is in the books. For Jake Mastriani, I'm Grant McCauley. We will catch you next time, and until then, so long, everyone.